Okay, great. Um, so uh, what we're going to do today, uh, there are a couple of components and one component which is uh, <laughs> going to be common is using PySpark. So last time we just got started with, uh, you know, uh, logging into the Databricks Community Edition uh, and starting a notebook and, and, and so on. So we're going to continue that uh, and then explore a little bit more about uh, these Spark based data frames, uh, just recapping the things that we saw last section. and. Uh, uh, and, and then, so, so we're going to cover some of that today, uh, especially we'll look at one uh, important, I guess, uh, component in the Spark ecosystem, which is uh, MLlib. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's very similar to many of your other general purpose uh, packages that you've been using, for example, scikit-learn. Uh, so MLlib also has a bunch of uh, algorithms uh, as uh, implemented in it, uh, but the cool thing is they work on uh, Spark data frames, and so uh, it, they can really exploit and uh, work on uh, data sets which are not, you know, single machine constrained. So we'll look at that. Then uh, the uh, key parts for today, uh, and the, the, the section for today, would be about uh, the notion of a streaming pipeline. And uh, under that, we'll look at what is streaming, how is it different from some of the other te technologies that we've seen. And uh, uh, streaming will be more about, uh, so, so the, today we'll be looking at training a little bit because we're gonna look at MLlib. Uh, and, but uh, the second part about streaming is more about uh, model deployment essentially. So you can think of a train model, but it, it needs to uh, uh, be applied on some inputs and, and generate some outputs. Okay, so, uh, so we'll look at streaming and then we'll look at a specific, uh, in, I guess, instantiation of it. Uh, we'll look at a specific uh, technology called Apache uh, uh, Kafka uh, and we'll set it up and do a small run on a VM um, or, or a virtual, virtual private server. And then we'll look at trying to combine uh, uh, PySpark, uh, you know, Spark with uh, uh, such a streaming uh, system like a Kafka. Okay, so so there are a few few uh, words I'm using uh, right now, but I'm gonna disambiguate them and we'll explore them in, in a little bit of uh, depth uh, as we move along. Okay, so uh, let me share my screen. Okay. So, so we were, so I'm just logging into the uh, DWX community edition. So, uh, I mean, I, I'm going to start with this uh, section three just to uh, recap some of the things. So, <coughs> so just to uh, recap, last time we were talking about Spark, right? So, what is the uh, purpose of Spark, and uh, how does it play in the in the rest of the techn techniques that we've been seeing so far? So, up to uh, I guess the first five uh, uh, sections, we were pretty much looking at containerization and and training models on essentially inside containers, for example but essentially on single instances. Although we were running, we could, you know, we could be using multiple containers across clusters, like Kubernetes cluster and so on. It was essentially, uh, you know, so, so the data had to, if it, it was residing, it was residing in a, uh, on an S3 uh, bucket or maybe on Google Cloud Storage. Uh, but if we were gonna do training, uh, we were reading it uh, in uh, uh, using appropriate uh, libraries. And, and we were training a model, if we were training a model in a single container, okay? Uh, and Spark was all about, oh, if you're gonna do any processing on data, why can't you do it in a distributed way? And, uh, and so Spark clusters or, or a Spark a base ecosystem would, would give us that capability. So we can look at even, uh, you know, uh, really large volumes of data, which are not, uh, you know, amenable for a single machine uh, setting. So, like, let's say the biggest container, if it has 100 gigs of memory or even a, you know, a terabyte of memory, it's still, that's the limit, right? Uh, so if you want to process data, uh, which is much more than that, then you would prefer um, to use um, some distributed processing system and Spark is a very good uh, example of that. 
Uh, and so last, uh, so in the first two sections we were talking about, um, uh, so essentially what's the selling point of Spark and, and we're gonna, since we have been pretty much, uh, you know, wedded to Python throughout, we're gonna be, we're talking about PySpark, you know, and, and in PySpark the key, uh, key uh, I guess, uh, object was the notion of a uh, Spark data frame and, and it, uh, you know, and behind the scenes how the data itself is split across multiple um, workers um, and 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 the same and and but in terms of interface, you would just think of it as a single data frame, like a pandas data frame, for example. Okay. So that's how we motivated Spark uh, uh, technology, and how does it bring you know how does it come in? Um, so, and in particular, last time we were thinking of um, uh, mostly model training. Okay, so or doing some processing on the uh, on the data, uh, and we were not really uh, worried so much about uh, model serving part. Um, and Spark clusters are the are the I guess the underlying collection of machines under on which uh, this training uh, happens. This distributed processing of data happens, and there are many solutions. Um, uh, one, I mean, you can certainly set up your own cluster, or there are actually uh, solutions by Google, uh, Cl Cloud Data Proc, and EMR. Uh, but we went, uh, we picked a, a certain vendor, Databricks, to illustrate uh, uh, how to work with Spark later on okay um but of course uh these clusters are expensive so utilization and all that you know so this is a business angle to it uh comes in in terms of uh, how big a cluster you need and how long and should the clusters be deleted after you do your job and, and so on okay so there is uh, that aspect but basically in a spark cluster you have a driver node uh, or, or driver which is the entry point just like in the in you can think of analogy with kubernetes and uh, various other things that we've seen um, so you have a driver node and then you have a bunch of worker nodes, okay? Most of the, uh, if you have a Spark data frame, the, the data should be uh, on, on the worker's side, okay? Uh, if you're doing pandas-based processing, then only the driver node would be used. So you have to, uh, if you exploit the Spark uh, data frames or Spark data structures, then you can really exploit the uh, distributed processing uh, capability, okay? And, uh, yeah, just, uh, and I was talking about data frame and we're gonna get into the data frame again soon. Uh, so uh, one key important point that I was trying to uh, highlight here is that uh, there's this notion of uh, eager execution and lazy execution. So PySpark based uh, data frames, uh, they don't explicitly, you know, so even if you pass a operation like, you know, filter these rows where the age is greater than 50, okay, some, some simple operation like that. It will actually not do the filter unless you need the results, okay, in, in, the, in, in the Spark system. Whereas uh, if you do a filter operation in a Pandas data frame, you will get the filter output immediately, okay? So there's that difference and, and uh, that's kind of a key difference. So next uh, in section three, and we're gonna get into this. Uh, so this is where we kind of uh, were towards the end of last week is uh, we picked up a particular vendor, uh, Databricks, which uh, you know, gives us a opportunity to try out um, Spark, PySpark features actually. And so it gives us, I think, a um, uh, 15 gig uh, memory, uh, single driver, no worker machine, uh, so a single driver, no worker cluster over which we can uh, try out some, some of the Spark capabilities, okay? Uh, so, so this is uh, where we, uh, and last time we were also, um, uh, so we had just uh, tried out an example notebook. So let's see if I can get to that. Yeah. So, um, so this is the interface. I mean, you can see, you can see that there are some, um, these are the common tasks you can do. Um, so what are the components, right? So for us, we want to get to a Jupyter Notebook interface and that's what this, this uh, uh, vendor provides. So uh, last time we were talking about, uh, so we were exploring some of these options on the left-hand side. Uh, the important thing is uh, the notion of a cluster. And if you click on uh, the cluster you know, button on the left side, uh, you can see uh, there are no clusters at the moment. So let's do uh, create cluster. And this is gonna be how you would, I mean, so if we have a UI here for creating, creating a cluster, but uh, I just wanna give you a sense. Uh, so let's call it some cluster, um, some name. And uh, so this runtime actually determines um, 
So you, you can see that there are so many runtimes. So this is what we've been talking about in terms of compatibility and so on. So currently uh, this particular runtime has Spark 3, uh, Scala, some version, and some other runtime will have GPU capability, but the, you know that may only that will only work on uh, if on machines which are, which have GPUs. Uh, and then you can, if you go down all the way, there are uh, different versions. Okay, so for example, 6.6 .6 has TensorFlow, 6.6 uh, .6 ML has TensorFlow 1. Point something, whereas now if you look at 7, uh, uh, sorry, uh, 7 uh, version, then uh, you have, I guess, TensorFlow 2. Okay, just, just to give a sense of, yeah, there's going to be variety in, in the runtimes. So cluster name, runtime is an option, and then uh, some details if, if you want to add some configs, and this will become important important if you're doing deep learning on Spark clusters, uh, but we're not doing that. Um, so let's say we just um, create a cluster. Yeah, at any point, if you have questions, uh, please ask or, or use the chat. Okay, so we, we're trying to clear the cluster. It's gonna pick up some instance. Uh, I mean, so since we're giving an instance for free, so uh, it's gonna take some time, uh, but it'll create an instance for us. Um, let's see. Yeah, so I think last time I also mentioned briefly, uh, so on this page, so how do we get here? So you can go back to the cluster and then it's still getting instantiated. Um, you can click on it. And uh, here you can see a few tabs. So let me just quickly explore some of these. So notebooks are just, which notebooks are related to this cluster? So, so Databricks lets you work with essentially Jupyter style notebooks. And, and so those notebooks have to be, you know, be running on something. And so that's gonna, if the notebooks running on this cluster, rev cluster would be listed here. Uh, in the libraries uh, pane, uh, we last time said, okay, we can actually install packages. So we can click install like a PyPy and we can install uh, like uh, one of the packages that we, uh, we, we use and we're actually gonna use it today. Um, Scikit Surprise, okay. Uh, we don't have to do it this way. We can actually do uh, very similar to what we do in uh, Google Collab or on a local notebooks. We can also do dollar, sorry, not dollar, but exclamation mark, uh, pip install, uh, you know, a package name uh, as well. So that works. Uh, but here, if we install it, it's gonna stay on the cluster uh, uh, without, you know, again, installing again and again on your notebook. So that's how you do installations. And, and there's some more tabs. Um, event tab actually shows uh, what's the situation of the cluster, um, you know, what's, and, and in fact, I, there was a screenshot in one of the previous, um, uh, previous sections here, <laughs> where I uh, showed that, for example, uh, I think this was on AWS, so one of the, uh, nodes got lost. Okay, one of the nodes is, is one of the worker types. So, sorry, one of the workers that got lost. So, these clusters need to have fault tolerance when they're doing data processing. That's a big, uh, big feature here. So, let's go back to, yeah. And then the, uh, uh, the, the section, at least our course page, uh, also talks about uh, how to install uh, third party libraries. Uh, actually, we will not need it, so we're gonna skip uh, this particular big query installation, but um, the idea is the same. So you can, again, click libraries, uh, install, and if you, uh, in, in that case, you could use something like a Maven, or you can also upload your own, uh, you know, jar files, uh, or, you know, Python packages as well. Uh, from your local machine. So, but we're not gonna do that. Um, next is Spark UI. It's actually a, a good way to show uh, how your job is running. So, so in the notebook, whenever we execute a cell, it creates a job and that job is sent to, if you had many workers, uh, then that job is uh, somehow distributed across the workers so that the whole process takes efficiently. Uh, uh, so, so you can view those uh, aspects here. Uh, and same thing, you get a lot more information on these things. Um, we'll probably not get into uh, these metrics and so on. Okay, so our cluster is uh, ready. So last time, let's click users. <laughs> so last time we were here. Uh, okay, there was some error. Okay, we'll see. So. 
uh, last time I was using this notebook. Okay, let me actually go back to this, the original notebook. So this is the notebook we were using. I don't know if this, these keys actually work, but let's, um, it's good practice not include keys um, anywhere. Uh, so, so what we're doing here is um, ideally in, a, in an organization, the key management will be very different, okay? So uh, here we are doing a shortcut of that. So let's see, um, so we're not attached to any cluster. So let's attach. And uh, executing the code is very similar to Jupyter Notebook. So let's do that. Okay. We ran that, but I don't think the keys are valid. Yeah, so that, those keys are not valid. So you can see a 403 happening here. So let me quickly add the appropriate keys. Okay, so we're back. I think this time the key should work. Um, okay, so <coughs> okay, let me just double check. Uh, okay, I think I have the snag. Um, so let's see. Let me try a different notebook. Okay, so I think the keys are not working. Uh, okay, so I think uh, that's fine. So we're actually gonna create create a new key pair. Um, so let's actually do that. Um, a couple of minutes of detour. Uh, so, uh, and this is something you can also try. Uh, you'll have to try anyway. So let's go to IAM. And click on users. And we can have a new user. Uh, okay, I guess we can just call it data bricks user and programmatic access and we'll just attach the S3 permissions. Oops. Okay. We'll attach the S3 access permissions. And uh, when we review, we can actually uh, I mean so this is the name of the user uh, and then create the user and you'll get to see uh, these keys here. Uh, again, let me stop sharing and copy the keys.
Okay, I don't see, uh, so I'm not going to resolve that issue. So it is not good. Uh, let's see. Okay, so I thought I'll, I'll do uh, this live, but I think I'll have to rely on a uh, previously stored notebook if I have. Um, sorry, uh, I'd let me get to that. Okay, actually, yeah, instead of running the notebooks, I can just uh, read the notebooks from here. Uh, so I think I have some issue with the with my AWS access. So why did I need AWS access here is just to read my uh, movie uh, data uh, files. So basically the movie metadata file as well as the user item uh, rating, rating file uh, from S3. Okay. So that's what I was trying to illustrate here. Um, so, okay. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I don't think this should work either. Okay, so uh, the idea was uh, to get read data from, so basically you can read uh, data from any external storage um, it's because the whole point of this cluster, by the way, is uh, it's ephemeral, which means that you don't wanna store, I mean, unless you keep the cluster on forever, uh, you don't wanna store data in, in the cluster itself. So you do want some persistent storage outside the cluster. And, and one of the ways is to use S3. Uh, so I was reading uh, S, uh, reading from S3 as CSV file and, and uh, displaying the uh, data frame. I think uh, what I can actually do is get the data from, instead of from S3, I can probably get it from desktop itself. Um, So let me do that instead. So okay. I guess there's an option called upload data now. Uh, so let's just, um, so th that's the location where it will be stored there, but let's um, browse and go to desktop and um, upload, uh, these data sets. So these two files, uh, that's what I had uploaded in S3 and that's what it says in this section on the course page. Uh, but let's just upload it here. Okay, so we uploaded it and um, okay, so next. So these are the locations where the files are. Okay, let me just uh, copy them. So let's, okay, done. So uh, what we'll do is uh, instead of doing this, uh, which was trying to read from S3, we'll, we can actually read it directly from the local location. So let's drop this and use the string. Yeah, so even reading the data is a Spark job. So that job is uh, being running uh, is is being run on the on the machine. Okay, so now we created essentially what is a Spark data frame. Okay, it's, it's not the Pandas data frame. Um, so we look at the type, right? Um, and if you want to, so very similar to. Um, so as I said, the, the execution is not eager for a Spark data frame. So unless I call, for example, to show um, the data frame. So this becomes a Spark job and you actually retrieve the output. Uh, before that, it actually, and actually here also, when I call display, only then the data frame is actually represented or um, 
somehow aggregated from all the workers. This particular cluster doesn't have workers, but if you had workers and uh, if you created a Spark data frame, uh, then the data which is split across workers would not be you know, on, on the driver. So this notebook is running on the driver machine. Okay, so this is the main machine. Uh, so only when you call things like display or show, then all the data is, is moved from workers to the driver and then it's uh, display. Okay. So dot show and dot dis and the display function are the same. So, so let's actually print the schema. It's just, it's very similar to, um, it tells you what the columns are and, and what their types is, okay? So, uh, and, and similarly, you can do DF, uh, okay, another thing. So we're reading a CSV file, for, which is, it's not really, a, I mean, it's a CSV file because it's essentially a text file with tab separation between, uh, between the uh, entries in that file. So once we have this data frame, we can actually also save it back to S3 and we cannot sh show that here because I have some access issue. Uh, but, uh, but instead of uh, saving it on S3, you can actually save it locally. So uh, I can use the same path um, and call it saved. And, and I'm gonna save it in a format called uh, 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 Parquet. Okay, so Park is a file format uh, which allows for, uh, so which is a distributed file format, uh, which uh, lets you s save a large scale uh, data set very efficiently for subsequent retrieval and mapping it to back to workers and, and so on. So this, this is one of the several formats of this nature, uh, which are used in such uh, big data systems. Okay, so I will, um, this is to above, and you have dot right dot. Point new data. Okay. So this this is again writing operations as part job. And uh, this requires, if the data was spread over multiple workers, you need to somehow aggregate it and, and, uh, and then dump it to uh, storage, okay? So Databricks has a, has a storage here, so that's, why, that's what we're using right now. Let me delete the S3 parts. Okay, that's good. Now we have the, uh, uh, if we wrote it in a format called Parquet, then we can also read from Parquet. And so this is what typically you would do. You would not actually read from CSV files. They are not the standard way to do um, this type of large scale data processing or large scale data uh, transformations and, and, and munching. So um, so you, you would read a Parquet file very similar to the way uh, you would write it. And so dot, dot read, uh, but I will skip the reading part. Now, this is the interesting part, right? So if you, if you have done a lot of data processing and then you have somehow aggregated group, you know, group the data, done some statistics and all that in a distributed way, uh, as long as your final result is, is really small, uh, you can actually convert that Spark data frame to, uh, you know, to Pandas. You can certainly convert any data frame, any Spark data frame to Pandas data frame, but, uh, but this, is, uh, this makes sense when the data frame is really, really small so that it can actually fit in the driver's memory. So here we are actually illustrating that you can convert to um, pandas and that um, data frame now is, is a pandas data frame. So you can do the usual dot head uh, operation to get a sense of you know, what are the columns, what are the first few columns, okay? So so what we discussed so far is uh, retrieving from S3, the commands are there, but uh, my access keys are not working. Uh, instead of retrieving from S3 uh, or any, any location for that matter, not just S3, you can read CSV files, you can write uh, Parquet files, you can read Parquet files. And, and you can also convert this data frame, Spark data frame to Pandas, okay? Now, uh, let's actually, and we can also go from Pandas to SQL, uh, sorry, Pandas to um, a Spark data frame, uh, that you can do by calling a create data frame, okay? So very similar to how Pandas would do, pan, you know, pa pandas.create data frame uh, from, let's say, a bunch of lists or dictionaries and, and so on, right? So very similar idea. So if you execute this, you get a Spark data frame. And uh, you can, uh, there are some methods to uh, Spark data frame. Earlier we saw the print schema function. Similarly, um, Spark data frame dot describe does something different. Like if you did dot describe for uh, pandas here, for example, 
uh, you would get something different. Okay, you'll get the mean, uh, you know, median. Uh, so all some some of the statistics are if the columns are numerical in nature. Okay. Um, so I think I've already shown you the print schema. So and there's also a new project uh, which or a new package called Koalas, very similar to Pandas, which uh, helps you bridge the gap between Pandas data frame, which is a which is entirely focused on a single machine uh, representation of data and Spark data frame, which is really optimized for multi-machine uh, representation of data. Their underlying, you know, their, their functions in those data frames uh, are, you know, slightly different in nature. And Coalesce is an intermediate uh, way to uh, use uh, uh, Panda syntax while still preserving the um, Spark data frames distributed nature, okay? So what I mean by that is that if you have a Spark data frame, then you can convert to Coalesce and then call uh, things familiar to uh, what you know in, in Pandas. Okay, so let's try this. Yeah, so Coalesce data frame. Uh, now you can do, like in, you can pick the column, uh, which is IID, uh, sorry, uh, the uh, item ID column, and then you can convert to NumPy and pick the three elements, for example. So this operation you could not do uh, on directly on Spark data frame. This, this does not uh, work. Okay, so uh, Spark data frame has a slightly different API. Uh, and so this Coalesce project is, is trying to bridge that. Okay, now, so here's a conversion from Pandas to Coalesce uh, data frame. And, uh, and, and so now it becomes a uh, Coalesce uh, data frame. So now what's happened is this Pandas data frame, which was on the driver, uh, once you convert it to Coalesce, then that's a data frame, which is essentially a Spark data frame under, underlying, uh, underneath it. So that is amenable for now distributed processing. Okay. Um, so one of the cool things about the Spark ecosystem is the Spark data frame can be interacted with as if you're working with a SQL table. Okay. So uh, here's a command. So you have a Spark data frame. You do a create or replace uh, temp view uh, and create essentially a table uh, with this name STF. Then you can do all sorts of SQL queries. Um, so some of you have done uh, SQL in other classes. Uh, so for example, here I'm selecting the distinct um, entries in the column IID from the table and ordering it by uh, ordering it by the uh, their values. Okay, so how do you run this? So once you have this, uh, so query is just a string. Okay, the so string is the SQL uh, statement, and then uh, I'm just calling. So and, and so what what we did in this uh, command is to create a essentially a table from this uh, Spark data frame. That's the string. Uh, that's the name of the table. And you just use the same name in the SQL query. Okay, so uh, you can run this. So uh, it's uh, it's running the job. So you can do various other things, right? So you can. Um, so it, so this query was actually a Spark job. Um, yeah. And then uh, you can also read a uh, metadata file. Actually, we don't have this, so let's actually create a different. Uh, function. So instead of this, uh, instead of read CSV from somewhere else, we're going to do the read CSV from uh, from file store. Okay. So when you read, it's actually going to be a Spark data frame always, uh, unless you do two pointers immediately. So let's change this. So we have a Spark data frame. Uh, we will call it the display function, but I think it's not a good idea to do the, do that anyway. If you, if you have large data, but this, for this it's fine. Movies uh, SDF dot. If you want to pick a sample, let's say four samples, just to get a sense of what this data set is, uh, then this is what you would see. Basically, a list of uh, row objects where the first column uh, is called underscore C0 because we did not give any column names and there was no header here. And the second column is called, uh, I guess, second column is called this and it has uh, the names of the movies, okay? So again, we can do a query. Uh, we can create a movies underscore Spark data frame table and then we can do some cool things. So let's see here. So what's happening in this SQL query? We're selecting the first column as so the the item ID, uh, which is the movie ID. 
uh, we're averaging the ratings of, of this movie. So what we're trying to create is a table, a derived table, which has a movie, its average rating. Okay, uh, and to get the average rating, we are using this function average. And when can you use this average? When you do a essentially a group by operation. Okay, so let me explain again. Uh, so this is the uh, this is the movie uh, ID. Uh, I'm getting the average rating by applying the average function, and I'm also getting the uh, number of ratings. Okay, so I'm getting the average of the ratings. I'm getting the number of ratings for each movie, and uh, uh, I'm also getting uh, the movie name itself. Okay, so how am I getting the movie name itself? Movie name is not in the uh, in this data frame, right? So movie name was sorry, movie name was not there in the uh, so movie name is there here, but it's not there in our previous uh, data frame. Okay, so what is it called? SDF. Uh, let me go back here. So SDF is a data frame which has the user ID, movie ID, rating, and some timestamp or something. So it doesn't have the metadata, but we can get the movie. We can get its average rating. We can get its uh, number of ratings per movie as well as its uh, name because we're going to do a join. Okay, so we are doing a join from uh, the first table. First table is SDF. The second table is movies, uh, com, uh, movies underscore SDF. So this comma is actually a, not a good practice. So you should do uh, basically an inner join on. Okay, so so you're selecting these things from this table. Inner joining. Uh, should I do an inner join? Um, I think I should do I think a left join. So actually inner join is fine because the previous comma thing was actually for a shortcut for inner join. So do this join on what? On the movie IID, um, the key in, in the SDF table is the same as the key uh, in the movies underscore SDF table. So this 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 column name is is uh, default generated, but that column had uh, the movie IDs. Okay, and then we're going to do a group by. So this group by is related to us getting this average rating and counts of the uh, ratings. And then uh, it's going to group by, but we don't want to care about um, movies which don't have enough ratings. So movies which are which have at least five ratings. And then we're going to average this whole table. So sorry. Then we're going to order this whole table in, in, uh, with respect to the average rating in a descending order. Okay, and that's what this, this sentence means. Uh, and then we're gonna just limit to the top 10 uh, Dutch movies. Okay, this limit is uh, just um, for the output table. So let's run that. Uh, so it says, you know, it took 0.27 seconds. It's actually not computing this, okay? This whole operation, SQL query is not being executed. Only when we ask for it to be converted to a panda data frame or like show or display, then it will actually execute. So let's see, dot movies. Uh, so we are we're converting this part data frame to a coalesced data frame. It's actually not needed, but I guess uh, let's do that. Uh, so, okay, so this is the final derived table. Derived table from so derived um, data are derived. Um, a Spark data frame from two uh, tables, and those tables are just essentially corresponding to Spark data frames. So you had two starting Spark data frames, you somehow merge to a single one, and you can see uh, here uh, the ID of the movie, uh, its average rating, and the number of ratings it has. So, uh, so the first movie somehow has very low ratings, but still you know has just high enough uh, average ratings is at the top because all other movies below uh, have you know more than a hundred uh, number of ratings. And uh, so this is a list of the movies. Okay. And you can actually see that by uh, by doing, so display. So this is the one of the features from, I guess, this vendor, uh, Databricks. So it can show you, um, uh, so it can, it lets you, when you do a display, it, it lets you also plot, uh, uh, you know, things corresponding to the data frame. So you can actually choose uh, if you want to look at the table only, so which is this, this table, or if you want to look at a plot, and this is that plot. Okay. Uh, where you can change the number of ratings or you can change other things on the uh, y-axis. So you can see that the number of ratings, uh, so the movie is worse off when it is number of ratings is higher, right? So you can see some, not a trend, but uh, there's a movie here which is not higher, but you can see higher number of ratings correspond to lower, slightly lower um, 
uh, average rating. Uh, okay, so that's that. And then you can again come back to pandas. So, so okay, so you could have done uh, the same group by operation. Like if you don't want to join with the second table, for example, you can also do a join with pandas. But uh, on Spark Data Frame, you, you don't have to go into the SQL land by creating that view and writing a SQL statement. You can actually do, for example, a group by with uh, item IDs and then do an aggregate operation and create a uh, aggregate over ratings and call that column average. Sorry. Uh, Actually, let's see. Uh, okay, okay, okay. So it's taking the column, the existing column in the Spark Data Frame, which is rating, and applying this uh, averaging function. Okay, so this is, um, and then the name by default is being given as average uh, rating, but you can change just like in pandas, you can change uh, a data frames columns by just calling, you know, data frame dot columns and, and assigning a different uh, uh, list of uh, column names. Uh, similar operation, but not the same can be done with uh, Spark data. Frame. Okay. So, uh, so that's the basics of PySpark. So this is just giving you a very quick glimpse of uh, how Spark data frames are manipulated and assuming that you know how to uh, manipulate Pandas data frames. Uh, okay. Uh, any questions about this part? So last time where we left, uh, we were actually, we spent some time on getting the data onto S3. So we were uh, like processing the data on a local disk, uh, the U movies, or sorry, U, U dot data, the movie lens data. Uh, right uh, that we that we used here uh, view dot data uh, so we were just doing a little bit of reprocessing last time towards the end of the uh, uh, session session uh, and then also creating an appropriate s3 bucket uh, last time okay. but um, we skipped that here okay so if there are no questions then let's actually move to ml So, okay, I think I just went through this basics without getting here. Uh, any points that I missed? Okay, file formats are important. Uh, by the way, the other file format, uh, which is popular is called Avro, A-V-R-O, uh, but Parquet is uh, kind of the standard uh, as well. Uh, yep, the difference between Spark and Pandas. Yeah, and manipulating Spark data frames. I, I'm, I guess, relatively more comfortable working with uh, the SQL type of queries, but you can certainly use the API provided by you know the Spark data frame object uh, to manipulate it as well. Okay, so we got the top movies, and yeah. So basically, uh, yeah, this is what I want to kind of also point out before moving on is that. Uh, the whole point is to work with really large data, okay? Data that doesn't fit in your local machine and simple Jupyter analysis, right? Uh, and so you want to uh, do least amount of work on the driver, okay? The driver should essentially, uh, ideally try to do the least amount of work. It's not always possible, um, but uh, to the fullest extent. For example, many of the Python packages, they're not, they're not a distributed, uh, they're not designed for distributed uh, computation setting, right? But you can, there are ways to get around it um, by ensuring that each of the package or the, each of the, uh, like for example, if you have a model, uh, right, a, um, let's say a PyTorch model or, or a TensorFlow model, um, then you can actually push e the model to, let's say your trained model, you can push each of the model to the worker nodes and, and then do inference in parallel, for example. Okay, so that would be a good uh, notebook. Uh, a, a, a slightly, you know, worse notebook would be one where you collect all the data and do the inference on driver, which is okay if the data set is small, but if you have a lot, lot, lot of data points on which you want to make prediction, then the, the former is, is going to be better, okay? Uh, and so this means essentially avoiding two pandas uh, if possible, especially with large data, which definitely not, um, you know, advocate, I would advocate not using it, but at some point, sometimes it's not avoidable. Okay, so now let's uh, look at uh, MLLib. Uh, 
Okay, this is, I guess, uh, a key uh, attractive feature for Spark as well, because you can do some uh, data frame manipulation, like essentially uh, what you could do in SQL, but what else can you do, right? So that is where MLLib shines. So it's a machine learning library, uh, very similar to scikit-learn and these other things, uh, but uh, works really well with Spark and, and can you know help us do distributed training. training. Okay, uh, so many of the models that you use, uh, that we use, for example, from scikit-learn or even uh, you know the scikit surprise library that we're using, or even PyTorch based modeling. They're not inherently; they're all they're all single machine bound. Uh, so it's literally harder to make them uh, train in a distributed manner. And so that's a topic in computer science, I guess, uh, software engineering to figure that out. Uh, but MLlib is is a good library to work with uh, as a consumer uh, of these distributed processing capabilities. Okay. So it has uh, algorithms for classification, regression, uh, clustering, collaborative filtering, and I guess in our I guess uh, narrative we are mostly focused on uh, recommendation systems. So we'll we'll look at collaborative filtering in a little bit more detail. So um, so what is our goal with MLLib? So we will first create uh, uh, just a simple surprise lib based uh, matrix factorization or collaborative filtering style model. Uh, uh, which is, a, which is similar to what we did before, but we'll just do it in the, uh, in the Databricks notebook. Uh, after that, uh, we will uh, follow the example from, uh, uh, the, the collaborative example from uh, just this link here, Apache's link, uh, to build the same model, but with using uh, MLLib. Same model in the sense that both are essentially matrix factorization uh, uh, models. Uh, for collaborative filtering, okay. So essentially, they're thinking they're looking at user item matrices, and then they're just um, decomposing or um, uh, they're just um, uh, creating a decomposition of this matrix into two matrices: uh, one matrix per for user, and one matrix for the items, uh, where uh, they are of lower dimension. Okay, and in the sense that the user matrix will have a dimension of ten, and the item matrix will have a dimension of ten internal dimension. So, uh, so we'll not, of course, rely on uh, this distributed processing capability because our node, actually, our cluster, the free cluster that we have, is, a, is just has one node and it's only the driver. But um, it'll illustrate the point. So let's actually uh, pick up surprise lib. Um, so let's go to um, surprise lib, and we are not. This is not working. So let's actually use our local data as a substitute. Let's fix this. Okay, we don't need anything. So surprise lib uh, is actually all processing is happening on the main machine, so it's actually not very useful. Uh, I mean, in the sense that it's not <laughs> exploiting any features of the uh, Spark environment. Um, so anyway, we read the data, and we, as I said earlier, we can either use a UI to install a library, uh, install a package that's missing, or you can just use a pip install with a dollar with a exclamation mark in the front. So in this case, it it, it ran, but it it says it's it's available, I guess. So next, um, next, what do we need for uh, building the model, right? So we want uh, the uh, the model uh, function, which is going to create our model artifact, and also uh, some data pre-processing uh, uh, functions. Okay, and in this surprise lips case, there are two, uh, I guess, uh, classes that we need to import and create objects from. And uh, if you want to, and since you're training, you can also uh, get uh, metrics and you can write your own metrics or use it from some, some package like scikit-learn. Here, there's already a metric available. Um, we're using RMSE because this problem, this data set is a data set which has explicit ratings. Uh, most modern recommendation systems, I mean, beyond the Netflix price from 10 years ago, uh, they're all uh, focused on implicit uh, uh, data sets. Okay, implicit data sets uh, don't explicitly ask users for rating. These data sets essentially are about our oh, user I interacted with, uh, you know, like item J, uh, which could be uh, like a, a article on on, a, on your on your uh, website uh, at some some time, and they spent five minutes on it or maybe ten minutes on it. So you can get those implicit feedback on how much they like that article or item or something like that. So you can work with implicit feedback, uh, but this particular model doesn't uh, by itself, unless you define what the feedback is a priori. Um, 
So, okay, some imports. And then there's a helper function which just generates the top uh, predictions for each user. Okay, so it's, it's just a function uh, that generates the top 10 predictions uh, for each user in your, in your data set. Okay, that's fine. So this cell is um, using the Pandas data frame that we just imported locally, or we could have imported it from um, S3 as well. Uh, it, it uses the uh, reader object. It just tells us uh, what the rating scale is. It's just a, you can read the documentation. It, it's, it's something necessary to create a, a data artifact. Okay? So this, this data set uh, class and load from data frame uh, function in there is just creating a intermediate processed uh, data object, which will be used to train our model. Okay, and in particular, in fact, the data object itself is not also not that um, messy. It's actually uh, build data, build, I guess, uh, from the data object, you create uh, what is called a train set. And this is the object. So let me actually um, execute these things. Okay, we didn't execute this. Um, let's have this function. And let's create the data object. Okay, so now uh, if you look at uh, data dot and plus tab, uh, you'll see uh, there are a few functions, right? So there's the data dot the data frame, does it, has it been split, load from data frame, file or folds, and, and various things, okay? So uh, so these are the uh, objects and, and uh, let's drop that. Let's actually run. So, so the train set, okay, so let's actually run this uh, below. Uh, uh, command. And so this is actually creating a training data set and passing it on to the algorithm. And this is very similar to model dot fit, uh, uh, like template uh, training uh, procedure that you've seen before, yeah, with, for example, with cycle. So, okay, so some training happened. Uh, so what is train set it, itself? Train set. Okay, so, so so this is a, this is just a pre-processing of the data. So the raw data was just user users, items, ratings, and I think it also had timestamp but we only wanted user item rating so we can subset it this way okay so those are the only three things we passed and if you look at train uh, uh, you know what is the strain set object it has the you know very simple helper uh, you know utilities or functions as well as fields for example number of items number of ratings number of users um, there's also this mapping of user id for example user id could be a string to a um, internal ID, right? If you're looking at a user item matrix, then you, you would prefer referring to uh, the uh, rows and columns using uh, like a natural notation, like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, for example. So there's those maps, uh, mapping from a raw ID to an internal ID, internal ID to raw ID, and so on. Okay, so that's what a train set object is. You can certainly read, look at the documentation uh, to uh, figure this out as well. Okay, so we fit the training, uh, we fit the model, and then uh, you can compute some numbers. So here, um, if you had an explicit separate test data, then you can use the test data by calling algo.test on, uh, on, on a similar uh, object. So this object, uh, test object has been created from training object in this case, but you don't have to do that. So this is, um, uh, this is in sample number, which is not very uh, indicative. So you would prefer an out of sample number. So, but this is how you would call it. So I'll go to test, for example, and then uh, get the RMSE uh, with the predictions. How do you get a single prediction for this library? We've been using this library for several sections. So I thought I'll go over it a little bit. Um, you would just pass uh, user ID and item ID uh, into I'll go to predict because the uh, because the train set had those uh, raw mappings, raw things, which is, for example, a string uh, with number 192 or uh, 196 here. Uh, because the train set had those um, item, you know, raw mapping, raw to internal mapping, uh, it would do that inside, uh, inside. so in, in the predict function. So you don't have to explicitly uh, map it. So you can always uh, provide the raw uh, user ID and the raw item ID. And you can see when, when you, once you run uh, red here, uh, so once you run the predict function, um, uh, yeah, so you can estimate. So in, in, so it turns out that this pair, there is no internal, uh, I mean, there's no number already present in, in, this, in this data set. Uh, so in the sense that it is not a part of your training, so it doesn't know what the true rating is, but it's estimating that the rating should be 3.5, okay? 
Um, and then you can also get the token uh, predictions by just calling the token function that we wrote earlier. Um, and, and you can look at it. So basically this for loop is just using the top end to figure out, oh, for user 196, uh, these are the top uh, 10 movies in that order. And then you can map this number to uh, the movies that file and, and get the movie names. And that's what you would respond to. Uh, that's what you would give back for, to some, some external service which asks for recommendations. Uh, so that's surprise web, but uh, so I just wanted to go over that because we're going to look at MLlib uh, version of the same idea. So, it's like, so in this case, we're going to use uh, some Spark feature. So let's actually again read the data, uh, not from S3, but locally. Oh, okay, it was detached. Okay, let's attach and run. Um, So we, uh, we ran this uh, Spark uh, read command and, and it gave us a Spark data frame. You can display the data frame. It's a, I guess, magic or it's a function in Databricks, um, uh, I guess, uh, in the Databricks environment for you, for us to retrieve uh, some information about this data frame. So this is the data frame, okay? Um, similarly, we can read the uh, movies uh, data frame. I think we did this a couple of times before, so. Uh, Let's do that from local location. And so that's the uh, two columns. See, you know, by default, they've been given some name, underscore C1, underscore C1. We can change it, but I've not done it here. And these are the movie ID and, and the name of the movie. Okay, uh, so now what we're gonna do is uh, try to do it this part way, right? So we have the data uh, loaded in the previous uh, commands. Now let's look at, uh, uh, so as I said, the Spark data frame, the underlying uh, behind the scenes of, of a Spark data frame abstraction, I want to call RDDs, right? Uh, uh, so, so RDDs are the basic elements in a Spark ecosystem. So um, these, these, I mean, so we are retrieving that, uh, I guess that object here as ratings, and then we're just printing out uh, what the, uh, and, and okay, let's actually run the cell. So, um, so we got this uh, ratings object. Um, so it's, it's this RDD. And then on RDD, you can do a mal manipulation. Like for example, um, you can apply a map operation, which is just a element wise operation that you're gonna do. So for every row, uh, you're gonna take row as an input and, and return the first element of the row as output. And uh, and that's going to create an intermediate. Think of conceptually think of it as creating a. Uh, you have a bunch of rows, in a, in a table. You're taking for each row. Give me the first element of that row, and 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 so you do that for every row, and you get a new table with just the first elements. Then you do dot distinct. Just creates a distinct elements uh, in that list, and then you're counting those um, uh, this number of distinct elements. So that's the number of users. Similarly, the number of movies uh, can also be uh, computed this way. So you don't have to do it this way. So actually, let me. Um, show below uh, in, uh, so data frame dot select. Right. Uh, and let's say UID is what is the name? Uh, I think it's UID. And distinct dot um, Okay, you should get the same uh, number for this. It should be 943, and similarly, you can do the same with the uh, other, uh, the other column, which is the item ID. Okay, so so that's how you would just get a sense of your data frame. But uh, but this operation is expensive, so distinct is fine. But the moment you add a dot count or a dot show or display, then it's actually executing uh, operations on the underlying data. Okay, that's the lazy execution part. So. So we're gonna do a few imports. Uh, so first of all, we're gonna import a, uh, functions uh, in the Park, PySpark uh, uh, SQL uh, uh, path. Uh, so these functions will help us uh, manipulate the columns, okay? Uh, as well as do things like averaging uh, and so on, if needed. So, 
Uh, also, we're going to import data frame NA functions, and and within the functions, we could have used f dot call, but instead of that, uh, sorry, f dot all these guys, but explicitly we're using uh, determine the functions. Okay. Um, so so it, it's the same path, the first and the third. Uh, but uh, you know, we could just do f dot udf f dot call below, but instead of that, we just um, explicitly calling these out. Um, so, okay, so what's happening in this cell? So in this cell, you're gonna take the original data frame. So it's a user item rating uh, and timestamp, right? So we're gonna do a group by with respect to items. So um, so that's the way you do it uh, without using SQL, uh, which is what I think we saw a few minutes ago, is do dot group by and uh, call is that, um, uh, you know, object from here. Um, so call of item ID, and then we're gonna do an aggregation. Right, so once we do a group by, we have to do some aggregation. So in this case, aggregation is get the counts of a uh, number of ratings, okay, for each each item ID or each movie, and then just call it counts, okay, they call the column counts. So once we do that, um, then the resulting uh, data frame, uh, which again, if you do a dot show, it, it actually gets executed, is this, right? So. So it's, it's the item ID and the counts, okay? And as you can see, that's a movie number 9496 has uh, these many number of ratings and some movies have only been watched by one person. So that's the uh, uh, way to manipulate your data frame. Now let's get back and, and use, uh, so we can actually use a function uh, which is available with the Spark uh, data frame directly to create our training test uh, and validation data sets. Okay, so here uh, it's a very convenient function. It's, it's there with every data frame. So you do dot random split and, and you pass a list of things of how many chunks you want to break your uh, data set into. Uh, here it's random split. Uh, and so it's creating as a train data frame, validation data frame, and test data frame. And all these data frames are exactly the same as our original data frame here. Okay, so train data frame will be exactly like this. Test will be a part of it. Uh, so it will be very similar to this and same thing with validation. Okay, so let's record that. And yeah, and 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 so I'm only showing this now, but uh, even from section, you know, session one, uh, we can always use a dot question mark, sorry, question mark at the end of the function to get a, and get its uh, doc string, which will tell you how to use it um, or, I mean, if you don't want to open the documentation page or uh, read more about it, you can just do a question mark um, at the end. So here you can see what does random split do. It just uh, lists, you know, um, it needs some inputs randomly splits the data frame with pro provided weights. Okay. Uh, and there's an example here. So now uh, next we'll need, next we are gonna import things from MLLib. And this is uh, interesting. So we're gonna get uh, uh, an evaluator uh, the algorithm itself, it's called, the, the algorithm to get this matrix actualization done is, is literally called alternating least squares, so ALS, but, um, and the same thing was called SVD in the surprise lib package, but all this mean the same thing. Um, then you also have a, uh, things like, I don't think we are showing this in this um, notebook, but you can also do cross validation and uh, build a grid of your hyperparameters and, and so on. Um, so it's a bunch of imports, so let's move forward. Um, so, and here we're choosing the, uh, you know, whenever, I mean, this is something standard you must have, might have seen uh, at other ML uh, uh, workflows. So this is just a bunch of hyperparameters being chosen for this model, okay, the ALS uh, collaborative filtering model. So we can run this as well. Okay, so, so, so what is uh, this uh, 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 this cell doing? It's uh, saying uh, so. It's trying to figure out what is the right rank. Okay, so we are actually doing a some sort of a very crude uh, hyperparameter search. Okay, so remember uh, we are doing matrix factorization. So we have this original matrix user times uh, user number of rows and let's say item number of columns. We try to break it into two matrices, okay? So the user matrix and the item matrix, okay? The original matrix is user times items, right? So 100 cross 100, let's say. Or, or movie lens, it's 900 cross uh, 1700 or something. Now, uh, what we want is a 
this matrix to be represented equivalently by uh, two matrices. First matrix is user times, let's say, 10. And the second matrix is uh, 10 times a uh, number of items. Because if I multiply those two, then I'll get back, you know, hopefully that approximates the original uh, user times item uh, number matrix, right? So now why this 10, right? So 10 is actually the rank or the uh, size of the latent dimension. So we are gonna do a simple for loop on, on, on ranks. I think uh, ranks was chosen to be, oh, can it be rank, you know, the, the latent dimension, can it be four or five or six or all the way to 12? So we're gonna do just a linear search. So for each rank, we're gonna actually try to fit the model. Okay, so for uh, rank four, we're gonna uh, call the model uh, with the number of iterations, or what is the regularization parameter, what's the rank, that's the one which is changing, and, uh, and, and other things. So this is the model object being created, and then model.fit, and uh, get the predictions on the validation data frame, and then, uh, uh, you know, remove the predictions which are NAN actually. So dot filter is very similar to Pandas uh, filtering operation as well uh, on the column, so prediction column. Uh, so it's uh, so it actually generated a prediction column. So this model or transform generates a prediction column to uh, work with. Okay, so this predictions has an extra um, uh, predictions column, and then evaluator is uh, just uh, applying RMSE operation on. Uh, the predictions uh, being generated and, and we have the true values as well because it's in the validation data we know what what the true uh, ratings were okay and and that's what you want to compare so truth is uh, rating and the prediction is uh, prediction column and then now you evaluate the uh, uh, you get the RMSC number itself so that's by just calling the evaluate uh, uh, function and then you keep uh, adding up the uh, not adding up but like collecting the RMSC values uh, in case you wanna use it for, you know, use it later. And if RMSC is, if the RMSC, current running RMSC is the smallest, then you just think that that is the best track. So let's actually execute this. Training div not defined because I did not run the splitting. Oh wow, I'm not even connected. That is not good. Okay, uh, let's actually, so if I run it, you will essentially see that there will be a bunch of, um, I think this notebook should be here. So we can just uh, look at this. It's not here. Oh, interesting. On this. Oh, okay. The HTML version is not there, but the uh, notebook and the PI file are there. Okay. Let's see what's the situation here. Uh, click on this. Okay, download it. Okay, let's actually uh, not not run it because I think uh, could refresh it, but. I think there's a lost connection to Databricks itself, which is uh, surprising, but let's move forward. Um, so, okay, so this we saw. Yeah, so I just wanted to show, you know, if you do dot take, it's, it's uh, you have the Spark data frame, and if you do dot take, it's just sampling three uh, arbitrary rows, and you can see it's just user item rating and timestamp. So that's fine, uh, so same thing with validation. Now, uh, yeah, here we figured out a good rank, okay? So in this for loop, which did not execute because the whole Databricks uh, access is gone for me. Uh, so uh, so we, we pick some rank, okay? Now here, uh, I'm just, so here is an interesting operation. What I'm doing is once I've figured out a rank, I've done the hyperparameter search, let's say I've done some cross validation, for example. I've used up validation data, I've used up training data, right? So once I've used those two up and I've figured out my best choices, then I should typically combine both and then again, spit out a final model, right? So the way you do it is to, to call, uh, you know, combining two data frames very similar to pandas is, is just uh, dot union. Maybe there it's called concat. So 
I think now I have access, so let me just uh, go back to the train split. Oh, wow, waiting for cluster to sh start. What happened to the cluster? Wow, uh, even the cluster got shut down. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm not going to run that because cluster starting will again take a couple of minutes. So here I'm just concatenating two data frames. Okay, it's just like uh, one below the other. And you ha you must have seen a similar um, union keyword in uh, SQL as well. So you union the data set training as well as validation. Now that you figured out your hyperparameter, which was the rank, let's say it was six or something. Um, then, uh, and then you can again do the final thing, which is outside the loop. Okay, outside the loop, you can just again fit with everything except the test data. Then, and then since you did not use the test data, you do a one-time report of what was the performance on the test data. Okay, so that's, that's exactly very similar to what, have, what, have, what we were looking at previously. Um, Yeah, so we have uh, so we have users. Um, so there's some random number uh, being chosen as a fixed number there, and and so I'm just picking a random user. So that's what I'm doing here. NP dot random dot choice is just picking one random user ID out of uh, these many number of users. Okay, assuming that the user is a number from zero to uh, you know 900 or something uh, for this movie lens data set. So I picked a random user here, and then I'm saying okay filter, and this is again a filter option, pick only those rows where the user ID is exactly equal to this user ID. And we could have written this in SQL as well uh, with the where, where uh, in a statement. Uh, so you get the users, uh, you get the users rows, okay? And, uh, and then we can sort by uh, uh, rating a column uh, with, let's say ascending is, ascending is true, then these are the lowest rating. Uh, oh, ascending is true. So these are not the top rated movies, actually. This is the lowest rated movies here. Uh, so this is the lowest rated movies of this user, 577. Uh, and you can do other things like, okay, for this user, what's the uh, uh, average rating? So dot describe would give you the average, uh, you know, average rating uh, of, of this particular uh, user. Okay, so the average rating of this user is uh, 3.8 and uh, and I can do a display of this user uh, by just looking at, okay, what is this distribution of rating? So this user seems to be, uh, so this is not in order. I see three, four, and five, and then two and one, but you can see that this user is skewed towards uh, four in terms of mode. So he's more skewed towards uh, four, uh, less than number of fives, and no twos and ones pretty much. Okay, so that's that new user. And for this user, we can actually, uh, um, um, make predictions, I think, uh, let's see. Okay, okay, so here I'm just showing you uh, our in command 23, we're just seeing some additional uh, SQL, like instead of explicitly using SQL, we can do uh, operations like this, right? So uh, we can collect uh, all the movies that this person rated uh, by doing this. Uh, and this collect operation is by the way expensive. Um, and then once we have collected, uh, or we can also do a filtering uh, where uh, we can look at uh, movie underscore counts uh, matrix or uh, movie underscore counts data frame that we created earlier. Remember, it was the item ID and the number of people who rated this movie, right? So we can filter all those uh, filter based on movie counts, all those movies which are at least rated 25 times, okay? And then uh, we can select the item ID and, and collect them as well. So this is the movies of interest. So we only want to uh, recommend movies which are at least rated by 25 people. Okay, these are the movies of interest. And then we can uh, look at um, the difference between like the size of movies of interest minus the set of uh, new user uh, uh, rated movies. And, and the difference seems to be, oh, I did not print the difference. Uh, there could be some movies. So this is just showing you that uh, some manipulations that you can do with Pandas data frame. So let me uh, not take too much time there. Um, Yeah, so I, I think uh, that's a, that was a, a not very useful. So uh, what we're trying to do was actually trying to figure out what are some movies in, the, in this cell, sorry, close this. What are the movies in the cell? Uh, so in command 23, 
what are the movies which have been rated at least 25 times and what are the movies that this person already seen okay and i made them as sets or lists and then therefore sets and i subtracted the movies that this person has already seen and so that's this users unrated uh, movies okay so that's how i got the movies that this person has not seen and once i got these uh, movies that this person has not seen uh, i can create a spark data frame okay so this is again a creation of a data frame very similar to how you create a pandas data frame so here i'm creating a data frame with um, user id uh, item id and timestamp because i don't have a rating for this because this person has not seen it but i'm going to make those predictions uh, by first creating this new users uh, prediction data frame and then passing that to the final model. Uh, so the input is the new user's prediction data frame uh, that this model. So remember, this is ML led model. So this is gonna, if this, this, this is the Spark data frame. So this whole operation uh, happens in, in a distributed way instead of, you know, in a single machine way. And then I can filter and pick only the predictions which are not, uh, not, uh, not a number, basically just things which are real number. And then I can start. So this is a data frame, which is all the new user predictions. I can sort, uh, uh, I can sort, I, I can sort, but first let me, uh, so we, we join with the movies uh, Spark data frame because the movies Spark data, Spark data frame has the names of the movies. So let's join with the, that uh, data frame. On what? We are gonna join it based on the item ID in the new users, uh, new users or predictions a data frame is the same as the movies uh, item ID as well. So we're just joining based on the item ID. We're doing a left join and then we are sorting in a uh, not in ascending order, therefore descending order. And these are the top recommended uh, movies for this uh, random user. Okay, so it's the same user, move, user number 577. Uh, and these are the movies uh, uh, that, that were recommended. Okay, and we can, of course, uh, return this. We can save the disk actually. So this is part of batch processing. You can save these to disk and uh, some other, uh, some storage or an application database uh, like BigQuery and then some other model serving uh, like function maybe as a class server can read it and, and then make recommendations. So any questions about this part? Uh, let's actually take a, a break uh, if there are no questions. Uh, I have a question about next week. So yeah. Maybe I missed it in the starting, but uh, so are we going to have regular lecture or are we presenting next week? No, no, we'll have a regular lecture. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you. So uh, next week, hopefully we'll look at uh, online experimentation. So there are a few things that we, I was hoping to cover that I've, that I've not touched, like uh, CI, CD, uh, get version control and stuff. So we'll see some of the topics we'll, we'll try to cover next time. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so, Professor, just uh, we have to just submit our video presentation and give you the link in the report, right? We're not presenting in the class. Like, in uh, okay, so uh, let's resume. Okay, so I just wanted to, uh, so before we switch on to uh, streaming uh, pipelines and, and one technology uh, there. Uh, so what's next, right? So we, have, we just saw MLlib uh, very quickly in terms of how to use the ALS uh, algorithm there, uh, as well as a little bit about the Spark data frame. So uh, that is a very quick introduction. So I encourage all of you to try it out uh, uh, and, and get, experience, get some experience with uh, handling Spark data frames. So, what we've done is barely uh, scratch the surface of what Spark, uh, PySpark, and MLlib can do. And these are actually, uh, uh, you know, key components in, in so many industries, uh, especially industries which are driving towards uh, ML, uh, you know, ML-based uh, solutions and services within their products and, and services. Uh, there's always alternative ways to do several things, several of the things that we've been seeing. Uh, so, for example, uh, the same uh, type of distributed processing can be achieved using uh, uh, Dataflow or Apache Beam, uh, uh, for example, are two alternatives, uh, uh, as well as, you know, you can use uh, uh, offerings from other, other vendors, not just the vendors that we've been using, uh, like uh, AWS or Google. Uh, so for example, DigitalOcean just launched this week, I think it was called the DigitalOcean app platform, I think. Um, I 
think if you uh, works, yeah, uh, app platform. So this is very similar to uh, trying to get rid of, you know, uh, from a single, uh, I guess, a data scientist perspective or data, you know, science professional perspective, you don't have to worry about all the underlying infrastructure, how to manage them, how to scale them, whether they're secure and so on. So it's, it has something very similar to, I guess, the serverless functions uh, that we saw uh, last time. So they just launched it last week. Uh, so maybe this is a project idea for somebody who has not yet started on the projects. Uh, so so if we, you can do things uh, uh, and, and you can do the same things in other, other technologies as well. So, um, so, so there's a lot of uh, choices available. Um, uh, the key component of a Spark ecosystem is essentially the uh, underlying, uh, uh, so it's essentially the Spark data frame and the notion of RDDs, as well as the notion of a cluster, the, uh, you know, uh, with workers and, drive, and the driver nodes. Um, the cluster size and the cluster configuration itself deserves some uh, look because uh, over provisioning and under provisioning uh, can have an impact on for example, your training time. Maybe it'll take 20% more time just because you under provisioned your, uh, did not match the cluster to the size of data set and the type of data set that you had, uh, that you have, okay? So there is some, uh, you know, gains to be had by tuning your cluster size to your uh, ML tasks requirements, okay? And uh, eventually uh, these jobs need to be complemented with some sort of a workflow management tool. So I think Databricks has, um, uh, may have ML flow. Yeah, so you can, uh, so if you see where my cursor is at the top right, um, there is this use ML flow tracking API to record runs from this notebook, right? So uh, as well as it has integrations with um, I think Git. So you, you can actually link to a Git, GitHub repository and, and commit this code. Uh, so uh, those are things that you can, I mean, so I'm side tracking to Git, but the whole point, the point is uh, about uh, complementing your uh, the Spark ecosystem and Spark cluster with a workflow management tool. And Airflow is something that we saw last time, is, is a great candidate as well. Uh, and Databricks may have its own, uh, as a vendor can may have its own uh, uh, offering there. So let's look at some exercise uh, points. So there are several, to just to get acquainted with PySpark, you can look at several uh, uh, existing resources on the web, uh, Spark for example, or, uh, there are a few resources that I've listed here. There's also a link, for example, which tells, you know, I guess in a subjective sense, what's the difference between a data lake and a data warehouse, for example. Uh, we saw a SQL-based uh, uh, processing of, uh, basically, SQL-based processing of uh, Spark data frames or, or the data, as well as um, uh, functional, where you do dot group by, dot select, dot filter. So, uh, you can, you know, if we, if you've done a SQL version, actually we've done a SQL version. So why don't you guys try to do a non-SQL version, right? And, uh, and the next exercise is for example, how to apply. So you can, when you create a data frame uh, or when you do a group by operation, for example, when you're aggregating, you're using some standard functions, right? Uh, but sometimes, so when you're filtering or selecting, you can actually apply arbitrary functions, okay? Arbitrary transformations to entries of the, of a column or multiple columns, okay? And that's achieved using what is called, uh, I guess, user-defined functions. Uh, and you can do uh, vanilla Python-based user-defined functions or uh, pandas-based user-defined functions to do these more complex transformations um, at the worker nodes and really do scalable pandas-based uh, transformations as well, okay? So it gets a little bit more complicated, but um, it's worth trying out that. Uh, so we have the surprise web, uh, uh, we, we use one model so we can uh, try to see if, the, if, if there are parts of it which can be, which can exploit the Spark, uh, distributed computing nature of the Spark environment. And uh, yeah, and the last point is related to point five, which is you can use UDFs to, uh, uh, instead of inbuilt aggregate functions, for example, like mean and so on, you can use UDFs and, and learning how to use that with a Spark, a Spark data frame is also useful. So, uh, Let's switch topic to now uh, streaming models. Okay, so we're going to look at uh, essentially three ideas: what's you know uh, uh, streaming versus batch workflows, uh, Apache Kafka, and Spark streaming. So before that, let me quickly uh, go to course logistics uh, to point out the objectives for this section. Um, 
So the objectives are, uh, again, the same three things. Understand the difference between a streaming uh, model deployment and a batch model deployment. Uh, yeah. Uh, and the second objective is to learn the basics of uh, one technology that we're going to look at, which is quite popular. Uh, it's called Apache Kafka. And the last part is to see if we can integrate uh, Apache Kafka with a PySpark streaming workflow. Okay, so PySpark, uh, so far what we've seen is essentially a batch workflow. So we're creating, reading the data, cre reading a lot of data, uh, creating some Spark data frames, doing some processing, including train using, for example, MLlib, and dumping results, right? So that's a, essentially a batch pipeline. Uh, a streaming pipeline will be very will be a little bit different and uh, has a completely uh, you know different way of uh, looking at it. So uh, we'll we'll try to uh, you know the goal one of the goals is to un, you know see if you can differentiate uh, a PySpark batch workflow from a streaming workflow, and we'll we'll try to get that get to that example. So let's start with the oops. Oh, we don't have this. Interesting. Oh, did I not make the comment? Okay, so what's the best way? Let's see. So I'm just going to uh, locally create those uh, web pages uh, and, and uh, commit them to uh, the website right up. So uh, give me a couple of minutes for that. Okay, maybe I should also pause it. Okay. Yeah, sorry for the hiccup there. Uh, I think uh, one of the operations uh, to push the local content to get probably did not work. Okay, so let's. Uh, yeah, so uh, this is basically uh, in, in lecture seven, there were three parts. So I'm starting with the first part, which is streaming workflows. So what is, uh, you know, so let's uh, kind of understand the word streaming, right? So streaming, stream processing is basically a paradigm in, in CS where you architect a system which exploits uh, parallelism to some degree, okay? So this uh, basically, so it's like wiring up systems or wiring up programs or wiring up computers such that uh, they can execute things uh, in, in parallel, not fully parallel, but uh, execute some of the things in parallel. And that is achieved by reducing the number of uh, by, by reducing the amount of synchronization needed between the interacting components or interacting systems for example so if you just think about it uh, so think of the batch by right task 1 had to finish and then task 2 had to start and then task 3 task 3 had to start if they were all you know uh, strongly dependent on each other but they were weakly dependent then you can imagine you know task 1 happening um, uh, Simultaneous to task two, right? So that's parallelism, and and that's just at the level of a, a batch uh, or a pipeline level. But you can imagine such parallelism you can you can have um, at at any granularity, even the even the most uh, smallest units of uh, computation uh, granularity. Not at the level of a single processor. I'm talking about uh, at multiple interacting systems, multiple interacting processes. Okay. 
Uh, so from our limited point of view, so it's a, it's a large uh, you know, field by itself, but uh, from our point of view, uh, or in, in particular from the ML deployment perspective, in such systems, basically we have to think that the data doesn't, you know, we don't have, we're not concerned with data residing in a disk or a storage location anymore, okay? So of course the data will lie, you know, will, will be there somewhere, but uh, we, we have to think of a time scale where data is in transit. So, so basically data is always moving uh, from some part of the cloud or some system to another system. And at some junctions it may get logged or at some places it may get transformed. And we are mostly interested in uh, if it gets transformed uh, at some places uh, uh, and, those, and those transformations happen to be just model input, model output type of transformations, okay? So uh, the way of, uh, you know, so this way of architecting, architecting you know, systems, um, uh, most of the systems that you use, like uh, Spotify and all that. Um, so this type of uh, systems have some benefits and challenges. So the benefit is basically there's no latency uh, when, for example, you want to do uh, model uh, prediction. Okay, uh, so the data can immediately get to the model and the model can immediately predict. Um, and also interoperability. So uh, because there is no loser notion of synchronization, these different moving parts can be in different, different runtimes, languages, systems, uh, and so on, okay. Um, and, and latency is kind of important for many uh, cloud native industries and cloud native companies uh, where you don't wanna see any delay in, in getting to a prediction or a decision, okay. Um, and, and, uh, and, and interoperability, interoperability is about, you know, you can use different, different components, uh, but they can communicate in a standard way. So those are some benefits. Actually, actually, the key benefit of parallelism is latency. Um, uh, but the challenge includes uh, both uh, on, on the software side to have a different type of fault tolerance system because the data is always, you imagine uh, it's transiting. So somehow you, you need to ensure that in transit data is not lost, similar to like uh, when data is lying on a disk or a storage, it's, it's not lost or it's not, uh, you know, mess, you know, or not just the data, but the computer the computation happening on it uh, has some fault tolerance built in. Similarly, each of the components in such a streaming system will also need to have some fault tolerance. For example, there's this notion of buffering of the data. Okay. Uh, but you know, some of these ideas will become clearer as I go forward. Um, so what are some streaming platforms uh, that, are, that are available today? So Apache Kafka is one of them, and which is what we'll kind of uh, try out today. Uh, but uh, there are others like, for example, PubSub, which stands for uh, Publisher Subscriber, I think, uh, by uh, Google Cloud, as well as uh, Amazon uh, Kinesis. Uh, and these are managed solutions. And these are all different. So it's not like Kinesis is a managed version of Apache Kafka, uh, but they are different uh, stream processing platforms. And you can see that because there's so many, uh, like Apache Foundation itself has Apache Flume, Apex, and Strom uh, as different uh, projects uh, as well, which all, which all do some sort of stream processing. So you can imagine, Given that so many um, solutions are well present, it's it's probably an uh, important uh, um, uh, paradigm uh, that many of these companies are embracing. Now, what is the goal of this paradigm? Right. Uh, for us, it's going to reduce uh, uh, the you know reduce latency, and therefore make our data science pipelines more real time. So. Uh, for example, uh, like we want to work with data as it is generated by an upstream component. So, so let's uh, go by examples. Uh, let's say if, if some users are generating data, maybe on Twitter or maybe somewhere else on your app, or um, um, maybe uh, um, so, uh, or some other uh, some other examples. But if, if users are, let's say users are generating data, this can be immediately consumed as as soon as it's generated without uh, anybody waiting. Okay, or without waiting for the data itself to be written to disk or to a data lake. Okay, um, in this manner, it seems very similar to AWS. Uh, oh, sorry, not AWS, but in general, uh, the serverless functions, right? So when the user generates the data, the data can directly go, um, you know, go to a serverless function, and it can immediately return uh, some, uh, you know, some processed output like a prediction. But uh, there's a difference, and we'll get to this comparison with serverless in a, in, a, in a couple of minutes. Okay. Um, another example is real-time recommendations, exactly uh, where users are interacting with the app and requests are made to endpoints, which immediately trigger various other things, uh, you know, uh, which are not just you know predictions, but you know, uh, other services which trigger something else. Uh, for example, like for example, if you are browsing a 
uh, online store and it needs to be delivered on the same day, then you know, you browsing an item may trigger a request to forecast if uh, same day delivery is possible, for example. Um, so basically, what's uh, defining characteristic of this paradigm is the speed at which these uh, services uh, interact with each other. And this is not at a small scale, right? This is at um, millions of uh, data points shuttling through uh, such a system. So what are real world examples? Uh, the first bullet point saying basically almost all companies uh, these days will use stream processing systems. And in particular, these companies use um, Apache Kafka in some form or the other. So you can click on this link, uh, Kafka powered by to figure out which companies, uh, you may spot some companies that you are aware of. Uh, here's two examples uh, for a slightly different stream processing system called uh, Amazon Kinesis. So you can see, see uh, for example, Zillow is a company which, um, you know, is a platform for uh, buying and selling of houses, real estate, right? So Zillow uses Kinesis uh, data streams to collect uh, you know, data from various sources, MLS listings, for example, and uh, get them and, and, uh, and, and updates home value estimates in almost real time. So that, you know, when people go to the, go to the website or the app, they see the most up-to-date information. Okay. So that's one, one example here. Uh, and Netflix also uses Kafka in a slightly different way. It uses, uh, uh, not Kafka, sorry, uh, it uses a stream processing system to monitor the, uh, how, uh, all of its applications are interacting with each other so that it can detect, uh, you know, whether like, uh, like the video serving service versus, uh, you know, uh, some other like, uh, 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 some other service, uh, you know, if, if they're related to each other, they can, you know, they can interrupt it and not fail. And, and if they fail, they can be detected and, and fixed easily. So this, these don't seem to, so this one doesn't seem to be an ML related, uh, on the face of it may not be related to ML related thing, but here, uh, home value estimation seems uh, like the data has to come to an ML service endpoint, which will actually, uh, our transit point, which actually generates a predicted home value estimate, which goes back, goes to an app, which displays it eventually to users, right? Uh, so, so let's now uh, talk about ML deployment. So we're gonna use a couple of terminologies uh, to describe this. First is, uh, uh, different services or different components in such a stream processing uh, system pass what are called messages. Okay, messages, records, data points, it's all the same thing. And there are two types of uh, entities in such a system, producers, which produce messages and consumers, which consume messages. So uh, you can imagine the users, you know, if user is using your app uh, and, uh, and so that client device is producing uh, messages to, for example, uh, the stream processing platform. And, uh, and then, Consumers, for example, a machine learning model can consume these data, this data from the from the stream processing, the stream streaming platform, and uh, make predictions. Okay, so those are production of our messages and consumption of messages. And of course, ML model can again also produce um, messages, uh, which are the outputs, predicted outputs. Okay. Um, so a couple of more examples here, but let me skip that. Um, yeah, so the challenge for ML is that the ML service has to scale when the number of prediction requests are very high. For example, uh, this uh, in this Zillow case, Zillow's case uh, you know, listings change all the time and if they're looking at across the whole nation, then uh, you can imagine so many changes happening, right? So, so many views, have, views so many updates. Uh, and so, a lot of, lot of events uh, are generated or a lot of messages are generated. So the model which uh, uses that updated information and re-estimates how, uh, let's say, how values, it really has to scale to a degree which cannot be done by a single uh, machine, right? Um, so the scaling can only be achieved in a cluster-like setup. And, uh, and you can say, what is, oh, I can also use a serverless solution here because serverless scales uh, horizontally. If the requests are 100, I'll just have one serverless, uh, you know, function like a lambda function. If the requests are 100,000, I'll have I'll spin up many many such uh, uh, functions, or just uh, you know uh, uh, by scaling up uh, the uh, resources used to do the serverless operation, right? Uh, but um, so basically, first point is saying that we cannot really use a single server or a single container-based deployment. So at least the container has to be many. You need to have many copies of the container. Um, or uh, you need to have uh, uh, this, like uh, some sort of stream processing capability. Single machine will not do. 
Now, it's, the difference with serverless technologies or serverless solutions is that um, they also provide, of course, scalability, uh, but they're essentially running on a uh, single VM. So each uh, Lambda function or a cloud, cloud function are, uh, are things within a container, even if they, uh, even if you replicate them, they're all restricted to their own single machines. Okay? But we saw how, uh, for example, Spark can work with volume where uh, you can actually uh, split computation. So if, if you work, so let's say one of the transit points or one of the components in this, in this uh, streaming system is, is a Spark cluster, then when incoming requests come, then those requests can be split across multiple nodes or multiple machines and predictions can be made. And uh, again, the predicted numbers can be uh, sent out. Okay, so there's this uh, distributed aspect that can be taken, taken advantage of. Okay. So what's our goal? Uh, our goal is to set up a single node, Apache Kafka streaming platform. Uh, this is very similar to our exercise where we set up a single node uh, Kubernetes cluster, right? Uh, and then uh, we'll set up a couple of uh, uh, Python processes to send and receive uh, these messages or basically data points. And uh, we'll also uh, kind of replicate that with uh, uh, PySpark uh, streaming okay, uh, on Databricks. So any questions about streaming in general? Okay, if there are no questions. Um, so, so let's look at one technology, Apache Kafka. Okay, so what we're trying to do here is to step back and just focus on a little bit more ML agnostic treatment of uh, how do you try, you know, try out or basically um, experiment with a streaming platform. So we picked Apache Kafka here. Uh, it's a popular Java or Scala-based uh, open source software. Uh, that lets uh, you know people you know that, that lets components stream messages to uh, one another. Uh, these messages can be uh, streamed from many many uh, endpoints. End so it has uh, um, uh, you know the APIs uh, the, you, to send messages to some place. You need to uh, know how to send it. So the uh, there are good APIs uh, available for many different languages and and so on. Uh, so it started out of LinkedIn about 10 years ago and uh, from its webpage, they claim that it's an open source distributed event streaming platform and it's being used by thousands of companies. Um, so we are interested in this part, which is, um, I guess, streaming analytics and data pipelines. Um, uh, and, and those are some uh, features that it has you know, from its webpage. So basically throughput, scalability, uh, storage, so storage is a part, uh, but we have to think about stream, uh, streaming uh, platform as a, where data is always in transit. At some, you can think of some consumers or some places where the data is eventually you know, stored somewhere like in a data lake or uh, on, on storage on disk or something, but that's not uh, the uh, key part. Um, but Kafka itself will store uh, data for us, okay? Uh, so we, we're gonna discuss some details about Kafka soon. Um, so there's other features, high availability, fault tolerance, and, and so on. Um, so um, I'm going to skip all these uh, details, but um, let's focus on what's the uh, essential architecture. Okay, so what how what is it? Uh, what is the uh, moving uh, blocks? What are the building blocks of this architecture? So uh, so first is the notion of producers and consumers and messages. Okay, so messages, as I said, it's like think of a data point or a feature vector or something like that. Uh, there's going to be things which is going to produce such feature vectors or, no, or numbers or objects like that, and there's going to be uh, other components, consumers, which will consume such uh, vectors or, or numbers or objects. Okay, uh, so these uh, producers and consumers can be any number. Okay, so uh, can be completely arbitrary, unrelated to Scala, Java, for example. Right. Uh, in, our, in our case, it will be PySpark uh, eventually. Um, and in fact, we'll see an uh, example with Python itself. Uh, the messages uh, are produced. Uh, okay, so now we get into some details about this, this Kafka object, uh, so our Kafka technology. So think of it as a piece of software, which is running on, a, again, a cluster, which means a collection of computers. Okay, and it's, it's enabling stream processing by letting producers and consumers interact with each other. So producers and consumers 
interact, but not directly with each other. Okay, this is the, the middleman is 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 uh, Kafka. So how does it organize itself internally, right? So there's messages being sent from producers. These messages are partitioned into what are called topics. Okay, so uh, within a topic, these messages are stored inside this Kafka cluster, for example, to maximize this this um, data transit metrics like uh, like throughput and and network efficiency and so on. And what consumers do is just uh, read from these topics. Okay, so let's say uh, producer one, uh, let's say user, user app data, user is using the app, uh, that information goes to one of the topics like uh, client event topic, client events topic. And then there's a consumer, uh, maybe some uh, Spark based uh, ETL job or something like that, which will read from this consumer the, that client event uh, data and, and do some uh, further processing. Okay, and so the, we, they have to have the same topic. So topic is just think of, you can think of it as just a, uh, a nomenclature so that uh, producers and consumers subscribe to the same topic to, to relate to each other in terms of producer producing the producing data, which is the same data that's being consumed by, the, by a consumer. Um, so messages and topics uh, have constraints. For example, messages, uh, older messages are deleted, older data points could be deleted if the policy is like that, or uh, 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 you know, so messages, only certain number of messages are kept and so on, okay. Uh, messages can be read by many times. So if a, like client event, so you, your app is generating uh, data and it's like, for example, it's a recommendation, there's a website or uh, something like that. Then it's generating data uh, that's sent to client events uh, topic on the Apache uh, uh, Kafka cluster. And the same data can be read many times by the ETL job, which eventually stores it into a data lake by an immediate um, serverless function, for example, to make some immediate prediction and uh, maybe some uh, other location for uh, reporting purposes and so on. Okay. So uh, the management of topics, partitions and messages happens on uh, the cluster, uh, this Kafka cluster. And this cluster's composition, the individual machines are called brokers okay so very similar to the driver and worker nodes in in i guess park uh, cluster or uh, in the kubernetes cluster there's the uh, um, uh, nodes um, you know there's a master or coordinator and, and other nodes so very similar idea okay uh, so um, and, and and under and behind the scenes they actually take care of uh, these topics or the messages are basically the data points are copied and synced across these multiple brokers, multiple machines, so as to take care of, uh, you know, fault, you know, take care of the issues related to um, faults, right? And so machines can fail, and so you don't want to just lose uh, lose data. So, so this is a, a cluster. So there are a bunch of producers producing data that touches this middleman, uh, which is Kafka cluster, and consumers can consume data. Okay, so you can always think of data in, in transit. One of these consumers can be something which is writing this data to disk, but you really want faster access. So uh, uh, from let's say, an, uh, you know, like a client event, uh, client app to uh, all the way to, uh, let's say some serverless function, for example, or even the PySpark uh, cluster. Okay, so let's actually uh, get our hands uh, wet. So uh, we'll set up a Kafka uh, on, on a machine. Uh, so uh, so the machine I'm going to use is uh, from Vulture, but uh, it's fine. So if you, you can use from AWS or your own laptop, uh, if, if it's uh, possible. Um, but we're only going to, so we're going to set up Kafka on a single machine. Okay, so similar, very similar to Kubernetes. So, but ideally, if you're in an organization, they would have set it up on a huge cluster and um, they would manage it. They would have full-time uh, uh, engineers to manage it. Okay, so let's uh, spin up a cluster. So, sorry, spin up, spin up a single machine. So I'm just gonna uh, create a new server. Uh, I just need compute, uh, location is fine. Uh, I'm just gonna choose Ubuntu, okay, 20.04. I'm gonna choose um, two, okay, two gigs of RAM. So I think by default chosen. I don't need IP6 and all that um, for now. And uh, all this is fine. So let me deploy this.
Okay, so the server started. So what we're going to do is now, oh, oh, what we're going to do, it hasn't yet started actually. Uh, let's see. It's almost ready, uh, but uh, I think we can get prepared. So uh, let's uh, copy the IP address and uh, we have a username and, uh, and, and password. So let's access th those quantities. Uh, let's copy the password and I'm going to run a local Jupyter um, instance. Okay, so that's good. So let me use the terminal. So we're gonna log into, we'll, we'll try to log into the machine that we just created. So root it. Let's go to the password. Okay, we logged into the machine. So next what we're gonna do is um, just set up the machine uh, with some minimal uh, uh, security and, and, and access so that, uh, so let's do, okay, we don't have dot SSH directory. So let's create, a, so what I'm gonna do is disable password based login and, and enable uh, uh, SSH based uh, login. So make directory. And then I'm going to create a authorized keys file. And I'm just going to paste my uh, SSH public key. Okay, so that's my public key. So I pasted that. Um, <coughs> next, what I'm going to do is um, disable pass, you know, password-based authentication. So So, okay, it's fine to uh, permit root login. Uh, that will disable uh, password based authentication. Yeah, I, line 58. Okay, then we can just restart uh, the SSS service. Okay, next uh, we can just allow, uh, so we're gonna also create a firewall. Uh, so first we are allowed port 22, which is the SSS port, and then um, we'll enable the firewall. So it'll at least stop the, uh, I mean, it's basically, You can 
say that it's denying all incoming connections except for on port 22 and where port 22 we just enable the we just disable the password based authentication so um, uh, so it's somewhat secure so next uh, what we're going to do is install java so let's uh, do that so apt install okay actually before that i think i should do apt is just a package manager on on this debian or ubuntu uh, type uh, linux OSs. so so let me do this um yeah so let's install java and we'll just do a uh, a quick startup of apache kafka to show the show a single producer and a single consumer uh, interaction very small scale example. In fact, we're going to uh, use uh, the example from um, Kafka's uh, quick start page. So, okay, so we install Java. Next. Um, let's uh, go back. Um, so, let's get uh, the Kafka version. Uh, it's just a zipped file. Okay, uh, that's the that's its name. So we're going to unzip it or un untar. Okay, so what happened is it's created a unzipped folder. Uh, we can go into the folder. So at this point, uh, what we've done is uh, install Java. So we started Java, installed, uh, so just disable uh, uh, password, password based login and uh, download, install Java and then download uh, Kafka. Now what we're gonna do is, um, save screen. Uh, so we're gonna cre create a screen session because we're gonna do multiple terminals. So it's good to learn screen or if you prefer use Tmux. Uh, so let's call the screen, make a screen uh, session by the name Kafka. Okay, so let's go. So we got into a screen session. So now we just have to start a few things. Uh, first thing is Okay, first thing, uh, sorry. So we did this, uh, we started a machine, virtual machine, uh, and we kind of uh, did most of it, except for things like failed to ban, we did not do. Uh, but we pretty much uh, started, um, uh, you know, set up our SSH access. And then we just installed uh, Java. Okay, we didn't check the version, but uh, we can check it. But this, this is how you install Java. Uh, it's not the, Oracle Java, but OpenJDK. Next, uh, we, we got uh, the Kafka zipped file, essentially a tar file. Uh, we unzipped it and we went into the directory. Okay, we are at this point. Then uh, what I've done is uh, start a screen session uh, with, this, with this command, uh, screen minus this Kafka. So we're gonna do uh, three things. One is, uh, so we need to do at least three things to get a uh, minimum working example going. The first thing is to start something called Zookeeper. Now, Zookeeper is a distributed configuration, as it says here, or a synchronization service. It's a, you know, it's it's a black box for us, and it actually is going to be removed from Kafka soon. So, we, yeah, but it's something that helps manage Kafka. The okay. so Kafka is a uh, process that we're going to start next. Um, so to start, we'll just um, run this command here. Uh, okay, I think I missed. Uh, I forgot to include the config properties. <coughs> oh, 
Okay, so this is the process running. Uh, because we created a screen session, we can do uh, control A, control C to create another session within this uh, screen session. And this time we're gonna run uh, 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 Kafka itself. So let's start this and see if it runs. Sometimes uh, if you use a small um, machine, then it will complain that it has, doesn't have enough memory, for example. But let's... Uh, Okay, now, so now the middleman is already running. Now what we need to do is to create a topic and be able to, and, and a simple pu publisher to publish to that and simple consumer to consume from that. Okay. So let's create another demo, another uh, session within the screen session, control A, control C. Uh, and so this is, uh, this, we're gonna create this topic. It's called, uh, the topic's name is called quick start and uh, and, and it's served from this uh, local host. And we're gonna change it to work with uh, uh, an external IP later, okay? Maybe potentially next class. So let's run this. So what it's doing is just run a quick, uh, create a quick start topic. So we need to assign topics to any messages we send. So we're starting with some topic uh, name. So quick start events is, is the name of this topic. Okay, um, so that's it. So, so the, the command terminated. Next, what we do is we can look at uh, a, a diagnostic command, like describe what this topic is about. It'll tell you some information, like how many partitions are you know sub you know in the topic. Basically, they're partitions, and partitions have the actual messages or actual data points. So there's only one partition, and there's only one machine here. So that's fine. Uh, we're not going to run that. Uh, and now let's actually uh, start creating a simple producer and a simple consumer. Okay. So Kafka provides a simple way to uh, do this by, uh, so what we need to do is we want the producer to send messages to quick start events topic. Okay, and, the, and where is that location? The location is local server. Okay, if it was an external IP, there will be an external IP here. Now, what does this particular program do? It's, it's a, just an example demo program. This is not how you, uh, you know, you would have more complicated services producing uh, events, right? But here it's just showing how to produce simple events and those events or messages are uh, text, okay? One line per, uh, one uh, text uh, uh, per line, okay? So each, each line is an event. So let's do that. So we, we are basically producing events now. So let's run this. So we can say hi uh, or whatever, 594. So those are two events that I now sent. Now these events, so this is a completely different program, all that's running on the same machine. So this, these events, because I know it's a local host, these events were sent to the local host, uh, which is uh, local host 1992, which is the uh, streaming uh, Kafka process, okay? So then now two messages have been sent under the topic quick start events, okay? Now we'll create another uh, 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 terminal session inside the screen session and now create a consumer, okay? So this consumer, it's gonna say, okay, uh, subscribe to this quick start events topic and give me all the messages from the beginning. And so you will see that this pro pro program now is interacting with again our uh, streaming server, uh, which is the uh, Kafka server, and is able to um, get back the uh, two messages that we sent. Okay, so let's see what um, messages, uh, if it got back the messages. So, Okay, so you can see that the two messages were sent here. So the broker in between is the Kafka cluster. It's a single nodes cluster because it's on running on a single machine. And uh, this is a consumer. I could have run this consumer some from other machine and we're gonna do these uh, uh, runs from other machines uh, in the next class. So now we can go back uh, to the previous slide, uh, you know, and say, let's say I type test here and you can see the test has already appeared. So, so the message from the producer to the consumer was pretty instantaneous, but that those messages are also being stored by the Kafka uh, cluster, okay? So, uh, and there could be multiple consumers. So this is one consumer, I can run the same uh, uh, command or the same type of process in another terminal and that would also get the same uh, messages uh, without issue and so on. So that's how you, you would, uh, you know, and you can imagine this at scale where the millions of messages being passed around per second and, and being processed on. Okay, uh, so uh, that's, I'm gonna stop at this point because, uh, uh, and we're gonna resume 
a uh, little bit more about Kafka and my price park streaming uh, next time. Um, any questions about this part? This, this is a little bit fast towards the end because um, I wanted to show the full minimum working example with the Kafka uh, cluster, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, Kafka cluster, and uh, are essentially a single broker because it's a single machine and a producer and a consumer. And, and we had to create a topic as a default topic and we just use quick start as the name for the topic. Uh, so what we're going to do next, as I said, is we're going to change these uh, IP to have a local IP so we can send messages from local machine, you know, our, you know your computer to uh, a, a specific uh, uh, cluster and, and then get, you know, some other downstream service getting those messages. Uh, any questions? If there are no questions, then uh, that's it uh, for today. Uh, yeah.